Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome back to the Global Neuroscience Institute Grand Round Series. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Natalie Goffman. Dr. Goffman is board certified pharma, uh, pharmacotherapy and critical care clinical uh, pharmacy specialist. Uh, she's a director of the neuropharmacology program at Global Neurosciences Institute, where she leads the neurosciences team in establishing innovative pharmacological practices. Dr. Goffman has a highly collaborative approach to treating critically ill patients. Uh, through her clinical pharmacology expertise, she has guided clinical and research efforts at GNI. Uh, Dr. Goffman has published numerous articles in peer-reviewed journals on uh, new therapies for the treatment of anticoagulant-related bleeding disorders, ICU paralysis and sedation, and complex neurological infections. She has also presented at national scientific conferences on topics such as antiplatelet reversal, pharmacologic management of patients after traumatic brain injury, and perioperative management of patients needing anticoagulation. Dr. Goffman earned her degree from the University of Sciences of Philadelphia College of Pharmacy and completed her residency at Abington Memorial Hospital. And Dr. Goffman will be speaking today about the paraprocedural anticoagulation. Dr. Goffman. Thank you, Dr. Glebus. Thank you everyone for uh, joining me on this topic. I think this spans both inpatient and outpatient because we often get calls of if somebody's bled and they need anticoagulation uh, after they've had experienced a hemorrhage or they're at a high risk of experiencing any kind of bleed. And what do we do with those patients? Because it's a balancing act of either doing um, anticoagulation or putting the patient at risk for clot. So the learning objectives for this talk include uh, indications for anticoagulation, assessing the risk of bleeding and thromboembolism based on patient presentation, and then determining the appropriate patient population that requires bridge therapy. Let's start with the first case. We have a 45-year-old female with a history of hypertension, diabetes, and TIAs. She was on the general medical floor being treated I can, uh, we're seeing your presentation with all the slides and notes. How about this? Now is good, thank you. Okay, I apologize. Um, so she is, uh, She's on the general medical floor being treated for complicated pyelonephritis. Uh, she was receiving prophylactic enoxaparin for venous thromboembolism uh, uh, prevention. And then during her hospital stay, she developed shortness of breath and uh, a CAT scan of the chest revealed bilateral pulmonary emboli. Uh, her enoxaparin was increased to the therapeutic dose, and then after completing treatment for her pyelonephritis, she was discharged home on enoxaparin with instructions to follow up as an outpatient for her PE. One week later, she presented to the ED after developing progressing, progressively worsening diffuse headache, confusion, and slurred speech. So this is where neurosurgery comes in because the CT of the head reveals an acute intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, anticoagulation was reversed and the patient underwent emergent neurosurgical intervention. So with this type of patient, um, you know, she's at high risk for um, thromboembolic events. She's already had bilateral pulmonary emboli, but at the same time, she presented with an acute intracranial hemorrhage. So when do we restart her anticoagulation? Is it appropriate to restart her anticoagulation? Um, is there, what do we do in the immediate post-op period after her, her intervention? Um, should we use any anticoagulation? Those are all questions that, that we answer when we go through a patient as complicated as this. So let's take a look at the indications for anticoagulation first. Um, each of these disease subsets uh, represents patients with an increased risk for thromboembolic complications, requiring bridging anticoagulation therapy in the periprocedural setting. So things like valvular disease with or without prosthetic valves. So this is actually something that um, gets cardiologists very, very nervous. So if somebody has any kind of prosthetic valve or any kind of um, heart issue that needs um, to stop their anticoagulation, 
the, a cardiologist almost say you, you stop it for the minimum amount of time possible because their risk of actually developing a clot is significantly higher than their risk of bleeding. Um, Intra intracardiac thrombus, AFib is another one. Uh, cerebrovascular disease. So if somebody had a cardiogenic or, or an arthrosclerotic stroke, um, they need anticoagulation as well as a carotid dissection. Uh, venous thromboembolism, a peripheral vascular disease, and then other conditions, um, factor deficiencies, oncologic conditions, pregnancy is another really um, uh, under um, appreciated uh, not to say disease state, but, but diagnosis that needs um, anticoagulation at times. The thing that we worry about most is the deadly complication of anticoagulation, and that's intracranial hemorrhage. It's the most feared and deadliest complication. Uh, it's likely why so many patients are undertreated with anticoagulants, because when we do our risk benefit analysis, and depending on uh, our patient that presents, some physicians actually say, you know what, their risk of developing intracranial hemorrhage and bleeding is so significantly higher, um, whether it's because they're a fall risk, because they're frail, um, dementia could play a role in it, any of those um, non, um, any of those other factors could, could really uh, sway prescribers to not, to not prescribe anticoagulation for patients. Extracranial bleeding, on the other hand, so the GI bleeding, hematuria, um, leading to death or disability is only 3% of the cases. Everything else, um, so intracranial bleeding, is about 76% of the cases. So that is why it is so important to really pick the patients appropriately um, when uh, choosing anticoagulation. Um, some risk factors for uh, increased ICH include a higher INR and old age. So as I mentioned, um, patients that are um, patients that have um, that have uh, uh, that that are uh, older that that may be a fall risk that may have dementia that may not be able to take their medications appropriately. Those patients are probably the ones that we're seeing in our emergency room that fell that hit their head that were found down um, that maybe took more of their warfarin than um, they should have because they took it in the morning and then took it again at night because they forgot. That All that being considered though, um, AFib actually increases the risk of stroke three to five fold. We know this. Um, and then the Im it's implicated in about 15% of strokes. So anticoagulation has been proven to be efficacious in reducing the incidence of stroke and systemic embolism in patients with AFib and mechanical heart valves. So there's a a growing number of uh, patients that are now presenting with AFib. It has to do with um, with age. It has to do with how pe how we're detecting AFib, and a lot of our um, technology has now really we were able to detect it a lot better than we were before. And there's again uh, th there's there's studies out there that show that um, patients that even had one episode of AFib will probably benefit from anticoagulation until the patient can either be, um, at least until the patient can be uh, cardioverted or whatever other process that needs to occur. So, um, so, so we really need to be cognizant of the fact that if somebody has atrial fibrillation and we don't anticoagulate them, they have a significantly high chance of presenting with a stroke. So we have to make the argument, when do we resume anticoagulation? So the argument for resuming anticoagulation, um, are sh there's the strong or near absolute indication. So if somebody has a mechanical heart valve, if somebody's in a hypercoagulable state, um, what's their CHADS score and what's their CHADS 2 VASC score? Also, um, the anticipated low risk of re-bleeding with successful source control and INR target control. So this, the, the INR target control is, is, is so important for our warfarin patients, and we're very lucky right now that we have such a plethora of um, direct oral anticoagulants that we can use um, where the INR control becomes almost the moot point. Um, when you look at what the negative and what 
uh, the argument against resuming anticoagulation, um, it's if there's no absolute indication for ongoing anticoagulation. Um, a lot of times patients present to the hospital and we do a med rec or in the outpatient setting and we, we see a patient and they um, we go over their med list. And one of the things that I always ask is, why are you on this medication? And unfortunately, there's times where, well, my doctor put this on it because I had a, you know, a PE six years ago. Well, that's probably not a reason for them to still be on anticoagulation. And we see a lot of times that that kind of gets lost or, or falls through the cracks with some patients where uh, patients are just, their prescriptions are refilled, their everything is renewed and, they may not be, they, the indication may no longer be there. Um, the, the other reason is if somebody's in the um, near completed uh, their planned anticoagulation course. So if they did have a venous thromboembolism and they needed that three or six month period of time that they needed anticoagulation and they presented with a bleed, if they're close to the end of that time frame, we're not gonna do further anticoagulation for another couple of weeks or month even. Um, if they have a high risk of re-bleeding or a uh, presence of additional risk factors for bleeding, and then anticipated high risk of morbidity or death, again, falls risk, frail, elderly, um, dementia, those are all things that need to go through our head of why a patient may not be the right candidate for resuming anticoagulation. In the hospital setting, the other thing that we have to take into consideration when we are um, when we are uh, looking at these patients is um, if they are, um, what kind of rehab services are they going to need? Will a patient need, um, if they're ventilated, will they be able to come off the vent or are we planning for early trach and peg? If we're planning for early trach and peg, we shouldn't be starting um, anticoagulation, uh, especially for, um, especially a warfarin or an oral agent until um, all of the procedures are complete. So, so let's, um, let's go back to our patient. So when we look at the balance, um, we've got the early start. So um, an increase in recurrent ICH risk, which is something that we, sh we need to take into consideration, as well as hematoma expansion. If we start late, then there's an increase for thromboembol th for any kind of um, further thromboembolism. And this is where the balance is. And this is where the argument comes in. So for this patient, let's take a look and see what we need to do. The argument for is that she's has a hypercoagulable state. Her CHADS2 score is a four, so she's got hypertension, diabetes, and then a prior TIA. Her CHADS2 VAST score is a five, so she had hypertension, diabetes, TIA, PE, and she's a female. So this suggested, this is a suggested adjusted stroke rate of five to nine percent per year. So, and then she does not have an anticipated low risk of re-bleeding. If we look at against, she has an absolute indication for anticoagulation. She is not near completion of her anticoagulation. It just started. She is at a high risk for re-bleeding because she already bled. And the anticipated high risk of she has a, an, an anticipated high risk of morbidity or death if rebleeding occurs. So basically, what do we do now? There's pros and then there's cons. So at this point, we're all clinicians, we are all scientists. We go back to the guidelines. And what do the guidelines say? Unfortunately, not a whole lot. There are no evidence-based guidelines to address when to start anticoagulation after intracranial hemorrhage. There's, um, there's certain uh, key papers out there that say what would be best, but a lot of these guidelines are actually based on very low evidence. Individual studies have attempted to address this, but sample sizes are usually small, and then there's a lot of conflicting evidence uh, when, we, when we try to um, generalize this to intracranial hemorrhage patients. So let's, we have to take a look and assess the bleeding risk. 
All guidelines to date regarding the reinitiation of postoperative anticoagulation are based on grade 1B or C and 2C recommendations. It's well known that there are limited data from these randomized controlled st studies in these areas. Every neurosurgical patient is considered high perioperative bleeding risk, and the degree of postoperative hemostasis will be the primary uh, determining factor to decide when anticoagulant is, uh, needs to be restarted. We have to take into account both patient-specific and then procedure-specific variables. Um, is the patient a high risk? So again, all neurosurgical patients are a high risk. And then the degree of hemostasis that we're able to um, achieve. Secondary considerations we need to take a look at are thromboembolic risk. Uh, the probability of having a stroke at 30 days following stopping of warfarin for a median of 10 days if somebody has a prosthetic valve is about 3%. For AFib, it's about 2.5%. And a cardioembolic stroke, it's almost 5%. So if we stop somebody's anticoagulant, and this is why we don't do this anymore for dental procedures, is if we stop someone's anticoagulant and they have AFib, um, you know, there's a high likelihood that they're going to present with a stroke and whatever dental cleaning they needed to have done isn't, isn't, doesn't really matter at that point. So, so we've really started to chip away and say there's less and less indications where we need to stop, um, where, where we need to be stopping anticoagulants and at the same time, we need to be restarting them sooner. We should be looking at the risk stratification for thromboembolism. Again, what's a high, moderate, and low risk? Any um, mechanical valves um, are a high risk. AFib CHAD score of a five or six or a stroke in TIA in the last three months, those are a high risk for thromboembolism. And then VTE within three months or severe thrombophilia. Again, we have to take a look and see when was this patient left uh, when I, if I restart the anticoagulation later, is this patient at a lower risk for developing a stroke or at a higher risk? So if somebody's CHADS2 score is zero to two, I could probably hold off on restarting their anticoagulation, maybe get a three month post um, ICHCT in the office and see if it's safe or not. If somebody has um, a CHADS2 score of six and has a mechanical uh, mitral valve, they're probably not leaving the hospital without starting an anticoagulation and potentially getting serial CTs to make sure that there's no hematoma expansion. So in the acute phase, um, bleeding outweighs clotting. So we always stop everything and reverse in the acute phase. Patients that present within three hours of symptom onset basically they have a 26% chance of hematoma expanding more than 33% over the first hour, and then another 12% expand over the over 20 hours. So in the first 24 hours, it is safe to say that no anticoagulants should be started. We know this, um, everybody's agreed on this, the American Stroke Association, Heart Association, um, uh, uh, AANS, everybody has said, do not start anticoagulants in the first 24 hours. So what do we do after 24 hours? The first 24 hours really goes by fast. So we have to assess the risk. Um, not all patients are at an equal risk for hematoma expansion. A large hematoma volume on presentation is a significant pre uh, predictor of expansion, possibly reflecting a more severe underlying insult. Early presentation, especially within the three hours, as I mentioned, appears to mark those at higher risk. And this could be because uh, these patients um, undergo CTs while they're still bleeding. So it, it's almost like a chicken and the egg situation um, because we um, they presented early and they're still bleeding and we're monitoring them. So we're saying, um, the, the hematoma is expanding, whereas if they presented maybe um, eight hours or 12 hours after their insult, they're no longer bleeding, but we don't know what happened in that first period of time. We don't have those, those serial CTs that we may have uh, for patients that presented earlier. 
Um, for patients that uh, are on warfarin, a higher INR is a significant predictor, not just of higher risk, but also of a more delayed expansion. Um, a lot of times, and I think that this has gotten better but with education, but a lot of times um, patients will get um, something in the acute phase. And then what warfarin does, because it's factors 2, 7, 9, and 10, actually um, have some long half-lives. They'll have a rebound effect, which is why it's so important when you're reverse warfarin, not to just give them something for warfarin reversal, but also to give them vitamin K um, because vitamin K actually starts working six hours after it's given and it prevents that rebound effect. Um, there's uh, certain re radiologic findings that indicate a higher risk. One is called the spot sign. So it's contrast ex extravasation after uh, a contrast enhanced CT. And uh, apparently uh, the more spot signs present and the denser the contrast, the greater the, um, the, the risk. Um, so, so, so that's also something that we have to take into consideration um, as well as other factors uh, listed for you. There was a study that was published in, um, in Stroke in 2017, and it basically was a meta-analysis um, of eight other studies that looked at uh, over 5,000 ICH patients. Um, there, uh, about 1,900 of those patients were restarted on anticoagulation, and these patients were followed for um, 7,000 uh, person years. What they saw was that the recurrence of ICH in those patients in the anticoagulant group was 8.7% and in the non-anticoagulant group was 7.8%. So there was really no difference in the recurrence of intracranial hemorrhage in both of these groups, um, which is very, very interesting data. Um, it For um, for to know um, that that really whether we start or we don't restart, maybe it makes no difference. But again, it's it's there's not a lot of proof behind. There's not a lot of other evidence after this study to show one way or another. Um, for risk of thromboembolism, there's there's a concern for two reasons. Um, first, patients usually have pre-existing factors of why they need to be on anticoagulants. Again, I keep saying over and over again, atrial fibrillation, venous thromboembolism, calculating a CHADS-2 or a CHADS-2 VASC. Um, then the other thing is intracranial hemorrhage itself actually increases the risk of thromboembolism. Um, there's a risk of 7% during initial ho hospitalization and then 9% during the first 90 days. So the actual risk of thromboembolism is it doesn't stop at, at a certain point. It's actually ongoing and cumul cumulative, which makes the, the decision of um, not starting uh, anticoagulation that much harder. So if you look at another analysis that looked at the association of anticoagulants and thromboembolic complications, this meta-analysis looked at 2,000 intracranial hemorrhage patients where uh, 790 almost patients were started on anticoagulation and were followed for 861 person years. What they found is that the risk of thromboembolism in the, six po uh, in the anticoagulant group was 6.7%, whereas in the patient group that was not anticoagulated was 17.6%. There was a significant inverse association between anticoagulant risk and risk of thromboembolic events. So now we know that if we do or don't restart the anticoagulant, that the risk of intracranial hemorrhage is the same. But if we do or don't restart the anticoagulant, the risk of thromboembolism is significantly worse. So this is where the scale tips more to starting anticoagulants rather than uh, holding off because the risk of thromboembolism is so high. So what do we do? We know that um, anticoagulants should not be resumed in the first 24 hours. That is something that we can definitely hold our hats on. 
after 24 hours, um, resuming anticoagulation is associated with a lower risk of thromboembolic events, such as stroke and MI. Um, the prophylax, for somebody that needs prophylaxis, it should be started one to four days after intracranial hemorrhage onset. For full anticoagulants, it should be seven to 10 days after um, ICH onset. And then we also look at the overall condition of the patient, the hematoma stability, and then the cause of the hemorrhage. So if somebody came in and had a hemorrhage because their INR was 15, um, you know, we know why their hemorrhage occurred versus if, if, it's, if something's going on and we're still not able to figure it out. Um, so, so again, we, we kind of look at uh, the, this, um, this high risk versus benefit of when to restart. Um, restarting postoperative anticoagulation with um, unfractionated heparin or low mo molecular weight heparin is based on two variables. So the thromboembolic and the bleeding risk. Um, and this is for an inpatient setting. We wanna start with something that we can reverse right away so that we can, um, so, so that in case um, a, a, a hematoma expansion occurs or a rebleed occurs, uh, we're not waiting uh, long periods of time. So that's why we start with something like unfractionated heparin. Um, so in patients with a high bleeding risk and a high or moderate risk of thromboembolism who have adequate hemostasis, restarting low dose unfractionated or low molecular weight heparin or not restarting anticoagulation should be considered in that after 24 hours. Additionally, an IVC, IVC filter should be considered in patients with high bleeding or throm thromboembolic risk. So let's look at another case. We have a 76-year-old female with non-valvular non AFib hypertension diabetes, a prior stroke three months ago on warfarin being considered for spinal laminectomy. She'll be receiving neuraxial anesthesia. So for this type of patient, it's, it's obviously a, um, a, a, an elective procedure. Um, so when should we stop her anticoagulation? And then when should we start it again? Is she even a candidate for um, any kind of spinal surgery at this point? What's her bleeding risk? Is a laminectomy considered major surgery? The answer is yes, it is. Um, so she is um, so, so it's considered major surgery and her two day risk of major bleeding is two to 4%. So that means that she cannot continue her anticoagulation while, um, it, it, she, she needs to be, um, full, fully reversed or her anticoagulation needs to be stopped prior to procedure. Uh, if she was undergoing anything that is a low risk, we can discuss and say maybe she just needs bridge therapy or um, no uh, stopping of anticoagulants. Um, when should we stop her anticoagulant? Um, again, um, warfarin pharmacology is a little bit complicated, but the, fa the, the vitamin K factors that are inhibited are 2, 7, 9, and 10, along with protein CNS. Everybody always forgets about protein CNS, but this is why bridge therapy for warfarin in patients that are warfarin naive are so important because protein CNS are actually the, the f um, factors that are removed first and they are pro-coagulants. So if warfarin removes factors CNS first, then um, the patient is actually at a higher risk for clot. Um, so we see a partial effect with warfarin at around 48 hours, a full effect in five to seven days. Um, Half-life is, is pretty long. Um, and really the recommendation is to discontinue um, warfarin five to six days prior to surgery. We, re we need that INR less than 1.5 to comfortably proceed with any kind of high-risk procedure. Um, so is she at high risk for thromboembolism? Um, and the answer is yes. Um, her CHADS2 score is a five. She's over 75. She has had a prior stroke and she has diabetes and hypertension. So her risk for thromboembolism is significantly high and stopping anticoagulant for five days poses a great risk to her. So she's in this category um, where um, she, she's got a stroke, she's got the high CHADS2-VAS score, 
And so what do we do for this lady if we need to take her to the OR? Um, the guidelines recommend that in patients with a mechanical heart valve, AFib, or venous thromboembolism at risk for thromboembolism, um, they suggest bridging anticoagulation instead of no bridging during um, interruption of warfarin therapy. So this is a 2C recommendation. It's a pretty weak recommendation, but it is something that we follow for a lot of these patients. So we admit them to the hospital and um, we make sure that um, they're um, on a heparin drip prior to taking them to the OR. So then they're only really not anticoagulated for about six hours um, versus having to, to, to not be anticoagulated for uh, five to six days. Um, so what's the alternative? Um, there, there was a study published a couple years ago, um, a perioperative bridge bridging anticoagulation in patients with AFib. It's called the BRIDGE study, and it was a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial comparing bridging with daltaparin versus placebo for patients on warfarin that had an INR goal of two to three and that had AFib. The primary outcomes for this study um, were arterial thromboembolism, so stroke, systemic embolism, or TIA, and major bleeding. Baseline characteristics of this patient is this is not an, uh, an all-inclusive list, but I want you to pay attention to the patient's um, CHADS2 score. So the majority of the patients in this study had a score of two to three. So these are not our high-risk patients, which means that the generalizability of the study is not what it was meant to be. Again, something to just keep in mind. The results of the study showed that at 30 days after procedure, the incidence of atrial uh, thromboembolism was 0.4%, so four events among 918 patients. In the no bridge group and 0.3% or three events among 895 patients in the bridging group. Major bleeding occurred in 1.3% of patients, or 12 out of 918, in the no bridging group, and 3.2%, or 29 out of 895, in the bridging group, which indicated that no bridging was superior to bridging with regard to major surgery. So does this mean that we don't need to bridge? Because there's some guidelines that say, yes, you should, and some guidelines say that, no, you shouldn't. And the answer really falls in the maybe category, because as I mentioned, the patients in this study had a CHADS2 score of two to three. So their risk of um, thromboembolism was, and bleeding was low to begin with. Um, patients, uh, th there's a lot of patients that are at this high CHADS2 score of five to six, where we really need to probably still bridge them. Um, the findings don't expect uh, to pay, uh, don't extend to patients undergoing anticoagulants. Um, uh, they don't extend to patients undergoing anticoagulation with novel or direct oral anticoagulants. So this was really a strictly a warfarin study. And then Patients undergoing major surger, surgical procedures um, so with associated higher rates of arterial thromboembolism, such as um, carotid endarterectomies, major cancer surgery, car cardiac surgery, or neurosurgery, they were actually excluded from the study. So the only thing that we can really take away is patients that have a lower CHATS2 score, we could probably not have to bridge them, but everybody else, bridging is probably still the safest thing to do. And, and again, this goes back to the understanding of if somebody is at high risk and a patient is um, getting admitted to the hospital just to be placed on a heparin drip, that's a question that gets asked a lot. Why is this patient, like this patient was an outpatient, they're going undergoing maybe a, a pseudo elective procedure and why are we placing them on a heparin drip when they were on oral anticoagulants? Why didn't we just stop it? You know, cost savings comes into play and it's really because they're at a significantly higher risk of thromboembolism and we need to bridge them. Those five to six days, um, they're, they're at an increased risk for stroke. Um, so so uh, the American Journal of, um, uh, the American College of uh, Cardiology actually came up with a different approach of, um, of, of, of bridging patients um, with several different factors. 
the first is avoid interruption of anticoagulants whenever possible. So we know this. Um, so we can potentially, um, for lower risk surgeries, um, not have to um, reverse or stop anticoagulants. Um, for some surgeries that, that are of a concern, we can actually just decrease the anticoagulant where the patient could be anticoagulated, but um, their INR goal may be a little bit lower. And then if interruption is necessary, um, we avoid bridging in patients at a low or moderate risk because that puts them at an increased risk for bleeding. Um, so, so, and then the third is we assess a patient specific bleeding risk. So the bleed map score is a great assessment tool that um, assigns a point for each um, of the following. So uh, prior bleeding, mechanical mitral valve, active cancer, or low platelets. And patients with a higher score tend to have higher perioperative bleeding risk and lower thromboembolic rates. So we, we can almost use the score and say, okay, which patients um, do we need to pay more attention to um, for, for, for bridging um, and for bleeding risk? Um, the fourth step is really to individualize bridging in uh, specific high risk patients. So if some, for example, uh, it might be reasonable to consider bridging in those with an unacceptably high thromboembolic risk. So active or recent arch, uh, um, arterial thromboembolism or mechanical heart valve um, uh, with a reasonably low bleeding risk and those who require oral anticoagulant interruption for more than a few days at a time, um, it, it may not be as necessary. And then when uh, bridging is deemed necessary, a more conservative uh, bridging strategy should be entertained. So um, do we overlap uh, low dose heparin with um, when warfarin is stopped? Do we stop something um, pre-procedural and um, only restart the heparin post-procedure day one, so 24 hours after their procedure? Do we transition early off of the heparin when the patient's INR may not be exactly at two, but we know it's approaching at two? Um, there's, there, there's, there's all of these different scenarios that we have to take into account, and a lot of this is, is, oh, is very patient-specific, and a lot of this takes a lot of hand-holding as well, because uh, every patient, we can't generalize every patient into a category when it comes to their, their bleeding risk versus their um, thromboembolic risk. The final case um, that, that I have for you is a 73-year-old male with AFib and a CHADS-2 score of four. So he had a prior stroke, diabetes, and hypertension. He's receiving dabigatran 150 milligrams twice a day. He has moderate renal insufficiency with an estimated creatinine clearance of 38 mils per minute, and he is scheduled to undergo a biopsy for suspected um, GBM. So when should we start and stop his anticoagulation? Um, couple key things to look here is his creatinine clearance, his CHAD score, and the anticoagulant that he is on. So for direct oral anticoagulants, um, I think right now we probably see more, we see and place more patients on direct oral anticoagulants than we do warfarin. And the reason for that is because it is just so much easier to manage direct oral anticoagulants than it is warfarin. We're not sending labs, we're not um, making sure that the patient is taking several different doses during the week to make sure to, to, to have their INR um, stable. There's less dietary restrictions um, and there's less side effects. Um, the, the, the biggest concern is there's not a very good reversal options. And I know we have some that are significantly more expensive than we, we like to uh, really keep on formulary. But um, again, it's just not as well studied and it's just the it doesn't have the history that warfarin does. Um, the goal of these is to seek minimal or no residual anticoagulant effect at time of procedure. So we have to take a look at the elimination half-life, uh, the patient uh, renal function, the procedure bleeding risk, and the type of anesthesia. Um, with warfarin, it's really easy because I check an INR. The INR is below um, 
what we need below the therapeutic range. So less than 1.5, we're usually good to go. Some cases we want it less than 1.2. And, um, you know, the, the procedure can start with direct oral anticoagulants, um, it's really not that easy. Um, there, there's theory, we could potentially send um, like a TT time. Um, we could send other um, labs that we uh, can correlate to uh, DOAX, but um, most hospitals don't have the capability to test and, and, and say, yes, this patient is or is not um, on a DOAC. So we have to look at each one. Um, one of the first things that we always have to look at is uh, renal function. Um, I, I always joke around about this, but um, we have to calculate the renal function. Um, I get calls and, and, and questions asked this patient serum creatinine is, you know, 1.8, can I restart or like what's the half-life of this medication and I, and I and I always just there's an app or like you can do it by hand but you have to calculate the renal uh, the creatinine clearance because that's how these uh, medications were studied if somebody's um, if somebody's uh, renal function is decreased then it's going to take a lot longer for them to um, to, to, to clear the drug than if somebody has normal uh, renal function. Um, the only one that really uses serum creatinine is the apixaban, where you can say at 1.5, you decrease the dose because they're not clearing it as fast. The other ones, they all use creatinine clearance because that's the PK studies that were performed. Um, the the pre-op interruption approach, um, again, it has to do with with uh, renal function and then low versus high bleeding risk. So I know that this is a busy slide, but the first thing you look at is what their creatinine clearance is. So if they have renal impairment or not for each of these medications, and then if they're a low risk or a high risk, you skip either you know, um, a, a three to five days burst of doses or two to three, depending on the medication. So this is, this is what you have to take a look at from a pre-op approach in stopping these medications. Post-operatively, again, if for low risk patients, um, you can resume six to 24 hours after invasive surgery. For high risk patients, we're looking at thromboembolic risk. So if it's a th low thromboembolic risk, it's 48 to 72 hours after surgery. And then if it's high thromboembolic risk, um, we, we, we can consider a reduced dose of the DOAC an evening um, after the surgery. And then on the following day, we would start um, anticoagulation, so post-op day one. So um, in conclusion, um, so periprocedural management of patients on anticoagulant is very common, but a very complex problem. We need to assess the patient and procedural uh, related risks of uh, thrombosis and bleeding, and a patient's thromboembolic risk should drive whether there is a need for um, an aggressive periprocedural antithrombotic strategy. Uh, the procedural bleeding risk should determine how the antithrombotic strategy is used in the post-procedural setting. Uh, thank you guys, and um, if there's any questions. All right, Dr. Goffman. Thank you very much. That was actually very great. And there was obviously a lot of science behind the, you know, anticoagulation, starting, stopping, and everything. There, we have several questions. Um, one of the questions, actually, uh, uh, one of the, uh, the people who joined, they are just asking to go over again, you know, the simplified that risk stratification and timing about restarting anticoagulation, you know, like 30,000 uh, uh, feet view, you know, uh, the, who are the high risk, low risk, you know, the procedure, which procedures are high risk, low risk, which and which patients are, you know, high risk of low risk of bleeding versus thrombembolism and restarting the anticoagulation. Yeah, absolutely. So um, patients, I'm trying to find the slide. Um, I'm gonna share my screen again. Um, well, I'll just talk through it. So patients that are at high risk for thromboembolism, um, patients that have um, any kind of, of mechanical mitral heart valve, um, any kind of aortic valve uh, prostheses, um, and then 
those that have had a stroke or TIA in less than six months with a mechanical valve. Um, if somebody has AFib and they have a high CHADS2 VASC score, so or, I'm sorry, CHADS2 score, so five or six, um, they're going to be at a high risk of thromboembolism as well as patients that have had that are that have AFib and have had a stroke within the last three months. And then if somebody has had a venous thromboembolism um, within the last three months, they're also at a high risk for um, a secondary thromboembolism. Um, now, the data you were showing, uh, it, you were using mostly like anticoagulation. Is this data about all anti, including all anticoagulants, or there is any you know difference between you know the older ones, warfarin, newer ones? So that's a great question. And a lot of the data that I've been showing is actually for warfarin because we have such a plethora of data to show about warfarin that unfortunately we don't have as much for the direct oral anticoagulants. Um, it's slowly but surely starting to gather, but it's not there yet. Um, so so there, there's not a lot of information and a lot of what we do is extrapolate from one to the other and see um, if, it, if it still stands true. Okay. Now, when it comes to intracranial hemorrhage, uh, it's, uh, if, if uh, we understand correctly, you said that, that for 24 hours, no anticoagulation, and then you, you know, you, you evaluate, you know, specifically, you know, tailored to the patient. Um, uh, do, do you need any, like, imaging guide? Is there image, does imaging play any role in making decisions, you know, about restarting or continuing to hold, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely. So, a lot of the time, what is um, recommended, is, especially for patients in the hospital already is you start anticoagulation and then you get a follow-up CT to make sure that there's no further expansion in the intracranial hemorrhage. Um, if somebody is at such a high risk that, you know, we really want to hold off even starting anticoagulation in the inpatient setting, we'll discharge them and see them back in the office in like a seven to 10 day period, because that's when um, we really should be restarting even for our high risk patients. Uh, high risk bleeding patients. And at that point, we'll see them back in with a, a, a CT of the head to make sure that everything is stable from their hospitalization and then re restart anticoagulation. Is there any data uh, about the, when it comes to newer anticoagulants that, you know, some of, you know, one of them maybe uh, is uh, safer than the other to restart when it comes to bleeding or? So there isn't. Um, anecdotally, I'll tell you that patients that come in with bleeding from the DOAX have, I've always seen a significantly higher um, or significantly worse bleed than with warfarin. For, and, and that's only anecdotal, but there is no data saying, you know, this one is safer than this one um, in terms of bleeding risk. They all say that um, they're safer. Uh, they have a lower bleeding risk than warfarin, but um, uh, comparing all of them to each other, that's not um, something that exists. Um, it, it's all about picking the right agent based on the patient. So um, for uh, a Pixaban, um, as an example, um, they did a lot of studies in the elderly. So patients over 80 years old, um, they actually have data um, and dosing recommendations for those patients. So if you are starting somebody on anticoagulation um, in that age group, it's probably going to be better to start that agent versus um, an agent that may not have as much of a robust uh, data. Um, one of the other agents um, that we hardly ever use um, actually has recommendations that if you're a healthy um, individual with a creatinine clearance of greater than 100, it should not be started at all because you're going to clear it too fast and then you're going to clot. So, um, so, so you really have to look at each agent and, and see um, what their patient specific recommendations are. You mentioned something about dental procedures, um, and uh, you know, there, uh, uh, physicians frequently get you know these requests. You, uh, you know, somebody with a stroke with atrial fibrillation. You know, they're on anticoagulation. You know, they need to stop. So, um, you, you said that the 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 you know the low lower risk procedures it shouldn't be stopped at all. So, 
which procedures would be considered low risk and high risk when it comes to dental and, and you know uh, and stopping you know or not or, or not stopping anticoagulation yeah so it used to be that i think for every cleaning um the dentist would request for you, for the patient to stop um anticoagulation and it was the same as that um that taking that uh, four grams of, of amoxicillin prior to cleaning, which they found really they shouldn't be doing either. Um, so, so most dental procedures don't need to stop anticoagulation unless they're doing like full extractions or things that, that have a very high blood loss. If we consider more invasive procedures as low risk, there's nothing in the mouth that, that we, we really need to be considering as, as high risk. And also a question came, could you comment about also the dental procedures in antiplatelet agents? So, so same, same, same idea. Um, really it, it's, if somebody's going in for a cleaning, if somebody's going in for like a, like a cavity filling, there, there's nothing that needs to be stopped. And honestly, for most dental procedures, we no longer stop anticoagulation unless somebody's getting like their all of their teeth extracted, um, there's really no need for it. Now, uh, another question that you mentioned about the heparin for virgin cord about Lovenox. Lovenox is also something that, that should be used. Um, the reason I say heparin, especially in that bridging period, is because of its short half-life. So you start heparin, you kind of get it therapeutic really, really fast, and then um, you stop it and six hours later, it's it's out of the body. You don't need to reverse it. It's just done. So basically a lot of our orders look like stop heparin at midnight. And then at 6 a.m. the patient is getting wheeled to the OR. So so that's the beauty of heparin. Whereas Lovenox, you need time. Lovenox has a little bit of a ha um, longer half-life. Uh, if somebody presents, uh, they need emergency surgery and they have an anticoagulation, uh, reverse it or not reverse it? Yes, absolutely. So if somebody needs emergency surgery um, and they're on anticoagulants, we will reverse. And also the antiplatelets. Also, so so yeah, so antiplatelets. The the recommendation um, to reverse is actually uh, platelets uh, along with DDAVP. Um, if somebody doesn't need, if somebody is bleeding secondary to an antiplatelet agent and they don't need the OR, you just give them DDAVP and you monitor them. If they need the OR, then you combine DDAVP with platelets. Well, Dr. Goffman, thank you very much. I think this was, you know, in some respect, eye-opening because how much science is behind the very procedural anticoagulation and, you know, anticoagulate or not. Because in the clinical world, I think many people are, especially in the hospital world, it's really constant struggle, you know, trying to, you know, see, you know, what needs to be done in order to do the best for the patient. So Absolutely. thank you very much.